So welcome to the Global Discussion, discussions with creatives, leaders and thinkers. Today I'm joined by Peter Benet. Uh, Peter, you're very welcome to the podcast. Let's begin by asking you to introduce yourself to our international audience today. So over to you, Peter. Welcome, everyone. I appreciate you for being here. Thank you for inviting. So um, I come from a very traditional advertising background uh, from London. Um, I worked for advertising agencies uh, for a couple of years, working for Fortune 500 brands. Uh, you know, it's, it's like a classic type of work that you would imagine. Uh, skyscrapers, glass buildings, uh, huge meetings, uh, huge pitch decks, and so on and so on. And uh, in 2014 or so, um, I started to notice and realize that most of my mates and colleagues, they started just working through their laptop and also, sometimes they don't even come to, came to the office and also like traveled around the world. And I thought that, oh, come on. I mean, London rates are really high. Uh, why would, <laughs> if anyone uh, was living in London at that time or even now, uh, rent is really high. Uh, commute is insane, right? So why would I do that if I can do everything that I do right now online and remotely? And remember, it was 10 to, uh, 2014, so it, remote work was still in pre-baby baby steps, I would say. Digital nomadism was just the first phrase that we coined at that time, so it was pretty new. And uh, I moved back to my hometown. Uh, I'm originally from Hungary, Budapest. Uh, you know, rents are lower, family is still here, uh, and I can do the very same work that I did in London. Um, for for a friction of the of the time that I need to put into the work, so uh, that's how it all started. The whole remote work journey for me, at least, um, and I spent like a decade uh, as a CMO for growing companies. So I spent in leadership positions, uh, participated in Series A, you know, and so on and so on and so on and so on. And uh, uh, to jump to the now, what I'm doing right now. Uh, a year ago, uh, I, I had my very first burnout, like it was a complete burnout. So I had to like stop working for months uh, after that. Um, the reason for that was kind of like pretty simple, but it was really hard to notice to me at least. Um, I was operating in, in very bad leadership situations. Um, so most of the leaders who are working in remote companies and Maybe that would be the main message that I would uh, wanted to share with your audience today, that most of the leaders that, sh that, uh, that work in remote companies, they either come from enterprise backgrounds, from in-office environments, uh, and they try to uh, apply their uh, enterprise thinking, enterprise processes, and, uh, and how they work and how they lead to a remote first environment for smaller companies. Smaller, I mean, below 100 people, uh, or sometimes even below 50 people. Um, or the other way around is that the managers uh, came to the remote companies um, uh, through a journey where they never actually spent any kind of work in an office environment. So they really don't know how to work closely uh, with people um, to achieve goals. And uh, that can lead into very serious misalignment, serious uh, uh, personal situations as well, not just uh, through the company and the, and the company's performance. Um, so my mission now is to change that uh, and help leaders to achieve something that I would call a remote first leadership. Um, they need to develop some necessary skills to manage leader uh, as a leader uh, remote teams um, and um, uh, somehow it sits between the two uh, uh, points that I made from enterprise experience apply anything that is applicable to a remote first environment because again I come from enterprise experience by the way uh, so I really know how to these people think and how they apply these skills to the, to the remote first sense of setup and also teach and coach the managers who never actually worked in a, in a, in a non-remote environment. And somehow the truth lies between the two. So I don't really believe that it should be an extreme only remote first 
uh, uh, approach or practice or only enterprise related uh, uh, company operations. So I do that through the consultancy that I have right now. It's called Anivar Consulting and I teach leaders to develop necessary skills. Well, Peter, thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, and for anybody who is in the workplace today, obviously going through a pandemic like the world has been through, and maybe still is going through in certain parts, um, that sort of speeded up this, you had to work remotely because a lot of countries and a lot of capital cities basically shut down. But it is interesting to hear you talking that, you know, way before that, many, many years before that situation, you were looking at it, I suppose, initially from a financial perspective, you know, working and living in London as a capital city, it's, not, it's expensive. And anybody who's worked in a capital city of a, a, develop, a developed and, uh, you know, uh, engaging country, um, it's, not, it's not a very cost-effective way of operating. And uh, also time, not just resource, not just the resource. So yeah. when, I, when I say resources, it also, yes, financials, but also also the time. So anyone who actually spends uh, any time on a, on a London tube would understand that uh, commuting uh, an hour just to get to the office and one hour back, so it's two hours, uh, that takes almost a day, working day for a week, uh, just to sitting on a tube. Um, or if you have US listeners sitting in a car, um that's that's insane that's that's a time from your personal life your limited resource thrown out to the window and my commute is two minutes so and that no one can change that and no one can i don't know pay me enough to go back to the office to change that two minutes to two hours that's that's insane you can spend that two hours with your family you can spend that two hours with your with your work uh, most remote workers actually more productive uh, than in-office workers. Uh, most of the studies show that uh, just because they don't need to commute, they have an extra two hours to work with. So yeah, yeah so not, just, to... not just the financials, but also the time. I wanted to ask you a little bit about that because I, I've, I've worked in London mm -hmm. and uh, just crossing the city, <laughs> you know, going from one side to the other for a meeting, yeah. trying to squeeze in two or three meetings in a day was pretty much impossible. I got to be mm. honest with you. It's insane. You you could yeah. only schedule one uh, uh, on-site meeting per day yeah. um, to visit a client because of the insane traffic. So uh, I had a different approach, by the way. So most of my colleagues, and I'm not sure it's that too much, too much relevant on, the, on this on this podcast, but it's, but it's kind of like funny. Uh, most of the uh, colleagues that I had, they all usually lived in the outskirts uh, of London. So they spend one or either two hours just to get to the office. I, I personally said that I never want to travel that much. So I always lived in the zone one or two, uh, like the central of the city. Uh, and even with that, I had to commute half an hour every day. Uh, and that's even too, I mean, that's too much for me. Previously, before I uh, was working in London, I had my own agency in Budapest and the office was like five minutes down from my flat. So I never commuted too much. And uh, I always felt I'm really conscious about my time and how I spend it, um, not just in work, but also in personal uh, spaces. And uh, uh, I, I never actually uh, wanted to uh, burn away my time in uh, in unnecessary situations, like commute. Yeah, and and I think whether you're talking about London or New York or Dublin or Tokyo, yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it, it, you know the same challenges. Everybody wants yeah. the talent there, but the cost of living and the 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 additional challenges that come along with it, and plus the the office buildings aren't exactly cheap to rent either for lots of organizations. And we've seen, haven't of we, course. in recent years, maybe some downscaling. There's a big discussion going on at the moment about repurposing office buildings for maybe living accommodation to help with cost of living and uh, lack of housing uh, for, for people. Re re remote work has a huge impact on, uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a practice, it has a huge impact on, on real estate as well. So on the... Uh, I think in our short term, we will see suburbs and like um, uh, outside outskirts areas of the city uh, to be more fruitful. 
because people will spend more time at home or around home um, and uh, they also need the necessary services. So there won't be any sleeping towns or, or, or sleeping outskirts where people only just residential and sleep and that's it. Um, but also other services will uh, pop up. So like, I don't know, grocery shops, workshops, uh, um, workstations, uh, co-working offices, and so on and so on. Because if you have a hybrid uh, uh, environment for work, which means that you are working remotely, but you also need to spend a little bit of time in the office, it also means that you need to still commute time to time to the office. So you cannot really live uh, that far away or you cannot really travel far away from the original HQ. Um, and I think uh, that will change. That will change for sure. So Peter, I wanted to ask you because uh, I've seen three different types of businesses. Mm -hmm. There's the business that I think you were touching on earlier where they were in the office pre-pandemic and now the either the owner of the business, the directors of the business, the management of the business um, just want everybody back. Let's go back to the way it used to be. And there's a huge disconnect there because they're finding it very hard because a lot of the people have experienced this new, better way of working uh, in inverted commas. And so there's that, there's that group. There's a second group which has gone down the, well, let's do this hybrid thing, come in for a few days, do a few days at home. Mm -hmm. And then there's a third group, which is the, the remote first group. And across that, though, the companies that, I, that I've that i seen anecdotally winning mm -hmm. are the ones who are saying, well, let's let the individual decide what's the best working practice for them. If they want to work fully remote, if they want to come in now and again, let them do mm -hmm. that. But where a company is enforcing their rules, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, it's been challenging for some of the biggest companies on the planet mm -hmm. uh, and also the smaller companies. So I'm just... I just want to ask you a little bit about your thoughts on that because the, there doesn't seem to be a one one way that people have gone. It's very fragmented at the moment. Uh, you're right, uh, first of all, uh, but there's a trick and there's a caveat to that. Uh, and uh, I, there is one way and it is called remote first, even if you are working in a hybrid environment. So uh, let me explain. Um, if you are working in, a, in an office, uh, that's like simple, right? So, I mean, you have your processes, you, most of the leadership approach that you have, um, we're already been here for decades now. Um, now you can do, uh, let some of the employees work from home for uh, a limited amount of time, but they still not need to come back to the office. That's called hybrid. Um, and most of the problems that we see right now is with the hybrid model itself, uh, because it leads to bias. So people who are into in, in the office uh, for like, I don't know, two days, let's say, they're closer to the decision makers, closer to the fire, shall we say. And those who are um, opting into more home office type work, or they are outsourced in different uh, uh, countries or somewhere else. So they don't even, uh, can't even uh, go to the hybrid office. Um, they kind of like left behind uh, from the main processes of the company. So, and there is a remote first companies, of course, who are already built everything uh, to accommodate re uh, remote first environments. Um, so the trick is to design your company uh, as a remote company and make it optional to go into the office. Um, and if some people uh, feel that they need the, uh, to go to the office to mingle with others, and uh, they need to uh, participate in real life event, uh, meetings um, or creative sessions, whatever, they can still come into the office, but it doesn't change the processes how the companies work. Um, and that's kind of guarantees that no one will left behind and no one will left out from the process. So if you design everything as you would operate as a remote first company, it, you don't need to operate as a remote first company, but, uh, but that guarantees that no one will left out from the decisions, no one will left out from the conversations and so on and so on and so on. And one of the key things to 
you can do to design in a way is to implement more asynchronous workflows. So synchronous is a meeting like this podcast, for example, uh, because we are talking synchronously in live. Uh, it doesn't really matter if it's you know virtual, you're in Dublin, I'm in Budapest, it's still synchronous. Uh, we also schedule this call, so it's a scheduled event. And uh, asynchronous uh, uh, means that it's unscheduled, it can happen anytime, and uh, we can be anywhere. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we can still contribute um, to, to, to provide some value. For example, an interview that you do in a written form, that's an asynchronous. You send out the questions and, and you get the answers uh, whenever uh, it's possible. So to implement more asynchronous workflows, um, that means that you can kind of guarantee that everyone will have a same in the company, how the process is and how the work is done and whatever. That's great. Thanks for sharing that, Peter. I want to ask you a question about when you take on information and the kind of books you read, whether for business or for pleasure. But I also want to, before we get to that, I want to talk about a book uh, that you have, because uh, you spend a lot of time ah. <laughs> helping leaders to mm -hmm. figure this stuff out and how, how they can become a better remote leader. So could you maybe... Mm -hmm unpack that a little bit and then we can talk a bit about your own readings thank, thank you i didn't want to pitch my own book as my as my favorite book here but um yeah so i wrote a book it's called leadership anywhere uh, it uh, describes the very same things and principles that i uh, shared here how to implement more asynchronous workflows in existing processes that you do right now so it's a long book, so it's not like an ebook. Um, so let's share just one example of what, what you can find in, in there. Uh, this is the most controversial uh, example that, uh, that you can find in the book, how to make asynchronous decisions. So a leader usually think that they make the decisions, right? And this is one of the rights that they usually reserve to the leadership. They are the ones who decide, um, well, no. So a synchronous decision making means that the leader is not the power player of the of the situation, it's the facilitator of the situation. So they share everything in advance with the team. The team also prepares some insights uh, to make sure that the, the problem will solve efficiently, uh, which is the goal of the decision, of course. Um, and they collaborate on the decision making process. That's called the synchronous decision making in a nutshell. Um, I also talk a lot about transparency within the book. So you need to establish more and more transparent uh, areas in your processes because transparency creates trust. And once you have trust with your, with your employees and your teams, um, that's when you have almost limited or zero bias and no one will left behind. Everyone knows what to do. Everyone is aware of the goals and how to set the processes, right? So, yeah, but apart from that, thank you. <laughs> Uh, apart from that, I think one of the business uh, books that I loved uh, so much is The Coaching Habit. Uh, it's a really powerful one. It teaches people how to be coach for their teams. Um, and the basic principle is just, just like listen, listen and talk less. Uh, <laughs> listen a little bit more to people um, because you get more insights. You can learn a lot what the problem is. Uh, there is a reason why you hire those people. You, so they are probably experts. Um, and through that listening, um, you can find better solutions. And also, you can su su show support for your team. That's the basic principle of the book. Um, and it uh, gives you actual techniques how to do that. Uh, apart from that, I'm kind of like that guy who reads less uh, business uh, style books and self-help and whatever. Um, I usually read, uh, I know it's weird, but poetry and, 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 the, and the actual like nonfiction uh, literature. So uh, I love science fiction as well, whatever. So, yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. It, it, it is good because, um, you know, if you read just one particular uh, type of of material, yes. it does it does make you quite 
insular it, it can restrict your views and opinions yes. on, on other areas and some great advice i received many many years ago was just to maybe pick something up that you would never pick up in a million years or you wouldn't yes. buy it. just understand a little bit about something else so I and you wouldn't that. and you wouldn't know how where you can where you can get those creative yeah. ideas I, I was a creative leader you are a creative leader as well so you know that 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 like creativity it, it doesn't really have that uh, boundary that you oh you only need to read two books about creativity and that's it no you should uh, go out and paint some paintings or write and write some poetry or or travel a lot or indulge in food or whatever so because that serves as inspiration for you and Peter just to wrap up the uh, sort of section on on talking about this remote sure. working you know you've worked in big companies you've worked in you know consulting you've been a chief marketing officer etc um you know when you look at a remote first environment now which you're a big proponent of mm -hmm. if you were to say to somebody you know bump into somebody and they said hey peter what's the real benefit of of being remote first you know what are the what are the sort of key just give me some of the advantages why i should do this what what immediately springs to mind for you I see it as a necessity. Uh, sorry, uh, but uh, you mentioned the pandemic, by the way, which obviously forced kind of uh, everyone to to do remote, but it also um, uh, opened up the people's eyes. I think in a way that they they don't need to go into the office. They don't need to spend enormous time, whatever, uh, commuting and stuff. Um, I think. And that's why I view it as a necessity. There is an insanely huge need or demand from the employer, employee uh, side. People want flexibility in how they work. If they don't get it, they won't be happy. I, I see it that it's that that's that's that simple. Um, so leaders and managers who are operating businesses need to make sure that their work environments are flexible enough for the employees. Uh, because it makes people happier and everyone knows happier employees become more productive and the performance will be uh, better. Uh, studies shown again that most of the uh, remote workers are actually not working less but more uh, and they are more perform uh, higher performers uh, than others. So you cannot have the argument that okay but if they are working from home they are always sitting in the pajamas and drinking tea and that's it right. So no, that's that's not the case. So I see it as a necessity. You need to do this. And if you don't do this, this year at least, this is like kind of like last last minute. Uh, if you don't do that now, uh, you will be left behind by the competition who are others are doing it. Because the people who are working for you right now will leave to those companies who uh, offer flexible work. And you don't see, you won't see this um, left behind competition uh, in a year, uh, yes, but but you will see within one or two or two to three years. So you got to do this. It's, it's yeah. It's thanks, simple. Peter. That that's very insightful. And Sorry. you're right. You're right. Talking about the, you know, some of that old archaic thinking that if somebody's not working in the office, they're working remotely. That they're they're almost not doing the job properly or they're sitting in their pajamas or whatever <laughs> but actually the opposite is true any study that I've read has said that people working remotely and I think you were saying this a moment ago they're actually more productive and that's led to some discussions about self-care and boundaries and making sure that remote people remote first people don't go overboard because they're working you know it, it's easy to Yes. blur that isn't it so that's yes. also a watch out for remote first too yes 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 uh, is it's, it's the, the reason for that is, is is that simple again people leaders who are managing other people they view performance as a as a, a flow of tasks completed uh, but uh, 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 we need to view uh, performance based on outcomes not, not on not on tasks and uh, remote workers do perform really well. They are focused on outcomes. Um, and the metrics around that is still archaic, shall we say, or like enterprise-led, uh, because that's what people learned in business schools or whatever. 
yeah good yeah. point good point so look i want to change gear a little bit now as we come that's fine i, just, I want to ask you a few questions uh about people that you look to that inspire you or people that you admire it could be from your early childhood it can be from somebody in business but is there anybody that you look to that sort of inspires you or that you admire i'm also that simple here it's my father um sorry um so he he spent 10 years in enterprise business uh, uh in a bank uh, whatever um and uh, and after 10 years uh he he took a leap of faith and uh, and become a like a kind of like a farmer so he, he bought up really huge lands of real estate and uh, and uh, started to develop his own own farming business and he is happier than ever he's He's looking younger than ever. Uh, he's more active than ever, um, just because um, he has the freedom to do whatever he wants. And I think that's, to me, it's really inspirational um, to be free from any kind of boundaries or, or, or limitations in your work, because it sets you free on the long term. And it's good for your health as well. Well, listen, thanks for sharing that because that's a, <laughs> that's a wonderful example, isn't it? I often hear about people who in the later part of their, their life have regret regrets or say, look, yes. I wish I hadn't chosen this career path. So that's a wonderful thing uh, for your father, you know, to be feeling happier, healthier, and yeah. to be doing something that he's obviously got a passion for. So thanks for sharing that, Peter. Um, what about advice? Obviously, you give out a lot of advice for, mm -hmm. to help people become better remote first leaders. But what about advice maybe that you've received along the way that you still hold on to today that still resonates with you? Mm -hmm. or, or maybe some advice that you'd like to share with our audience? So um, I was pretty hard headed, shall we say, uh, when I was a uh, when I was in leadership roles and uh, um, in the advertising business, you know, you got to you know, struggle a little. Um, and um, one of the managers that I had, um, he told me uh, that Peter, 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 when you communicate with your team, less me, more we. Uh, and that was like a rewiring of my brain, uh, totally. So I think it's really important. Less of me, more of we. Um, that's a really good advice because you don't need to focus on what you can do to achieve the goals uh, with your team, but you need to focus on what we as a team can achieve. That was a really, really huge advice for me, at least. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And it, it's it's funny, isn't it, how that's kind of almost central to a lot of the things that you're doing today in terms of collaboration and yes. processes and removing bias from the workplace. Um, and everybody, you know, so that everybody gets to... A voice i suppose that's really yeah important. now as we record this uh for the global <laughs> discussion uh we've got many many new months ahead of us so what is it that you're thinking about what are you focused on what are you passionate about what do you think is going to be taking up your time over the next sort of six to 12 months peter Ooh, um there is there are three things one is the one is the industry which i think uh uh 2020 yeah. 2023 is the year uh, when remote work kind of like become a teenager uh, from the baby steps and the, and, the, and the kindergarten period. So everyone will take it seriously. Uh, and I think that's a really good thing uh, for, especially for employees. Uh, I would love to see more, more companies adopt uh, at least a hybrid model uh, or a remote first model. Big companies, I mean enterprise companies, not just startups and growing ones. Um, on a on a personal level, uh, or at least my professional level, sorry, um, I'm trying to launch a course now, um, which focused on, on exclusively on individuals, because I think uh, uh, managers can become great leaders, but you gotta gotta start somewhere. Um, and leaders are made from managers. Uh, uh, and that's therefore remote first managers is one of my main uh, targets which I, I want to develop and this this is through a, a course uh, so that's what I'm trying to launch uh, also I'm launching my podcast as well and uh, creating a lot of content around remote work so I hope I will I will be able to level up my 
uh, reach with everything and I share a lot of lot of lot of learnings and a lot of knowledge that I have for free. Uh, on a personal note, uh, uh, <laughs> trying to move to Verona full time, so I don't want to live in a, a um, bilateral HQ all the time. So, <laughs> um, yeah, pretty much that's it. Yeah, that's great because you're kind of working between both Budapest and yeah, and that's Italy not really at the good. moment, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, listen, I really appreciate you, you sharing that and. Uh, it seems like you've got a, an awful lot planned, but I, I just wanted to go back to something that you said. I've never heard anybody say, you know, um, in the contents of remote first, that we're kind of going from the sort of the baby to the teenager uh, <laughs> stage. And that's actually a great way of putting it because uh -huh. at the time of recording this, we're seeing a lot of uh, high end global tech companies, maybe laying off 10% of their workforce. But, mm -hmm. they are, but they're also embracing remote first and mm -hmm. remote working because all of a sudden the penny seems to have dropped in some cases, mm -hmm. but it's all about the talent. And a lot of this work can be done from anywhere on the planet. So we are yes. seeing a shift there, which as you quite rightly said earlier, impacts everything from processes to how you run your business to the real estate market. So it will be very interesting to see that adolescent teenager uh remote first uh, go through as we go through to 2023 so thanks for thanks for sort of giving me that uh that, <laughs> you're that, welcome that but it's still a teen but it's still a teenager so we will make mistakes yes, along the yeah. way so that's yeah. that's fine yeah. but at least we are you know starting to get serious about it I appreciate the viewpoint. <laughs> um, so look, before I wrap up, I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything, Peter. Is there anything sure. else that you'd like to share with us? And also maybe if somebody wanted to get in touch with you, whether it's about the book or the courses that you're working on, or just maybe just to get some advice in terms of, you know, being a better leader in this remote first world, where's the best place for people to find you? So anything that else that you want to mention? And also, how would somebody get in touch with you? Sure, thank you. So uh, I think one of the key messages that I want to get across is that you are not alone as a manager. If you want to become a little bit better in remote leadership, you are not alone. You are supported, not just by me, by the way, uh, me personally, yes, but also there are other consultants and other companies that uh, share a lot of really interesting information around this topic. So, you know, Google, go on LinkedIn, find more resources. Most of them are free uh that's a good thing um and and indulge uh learn as much as you can because you will need that knowledge in the long term uh if you want to work with me or find my particular resources it's pretty easy you go to anywhere.consulting i share two two different things uh one is paid one is free uh paid is a book and a course uh and the other ones are all free resources uh, blog post, newsletter, weekly newsletter, I operate a weekly newsletter, leadership anywhere. Uh, and uh, and there, are, there will be a podcast episodes uh, and series around remote work and remote leadership. So I share everything, most that I learn. So just hit follow. You can find me on LinkedIn as well. Peter Bimiai. Well, thanks for, thanks for letting us know. So if you look, if you're interested in becoming a better leader for your remote team, anywhere.consulting would be a great place to start. So, Peter, that, that brings us nicely to the end of this episode today of the global discussion. So thank you to everybody who's been watching or listening this, to this episode. Make sure that you like, subscribe, follow, do all the usual things that you do for a podcast. And I hope that you'll uh, tune back in to watch some watch and listen to some more global discussions with creatives, leaders and thinkers. So thanks very much, Peter. It's been a pleasure. That was wonderful. Thank you for the for the for the for the recording. It was really wonderful. Thank you for inviting me.